Hello Hazel and welcome to Thursday's recording of The Night Bus Hero. I hope you've had a lovely day in school. I'm sure you have. I had a pretty quiet day actually. Well, to be perfectly honest, a little bit of a lazy day. I've just done a little bit of cooking, watched a few programmes on television that I've caught up on and not a lot else to be quite honest. But, uh, you know, sometimes you get days like that, don't you? But Anyway, we're going to catch up with Hector. We left him. He had, he felt tricked Mr. and Mrs. McEwen, hadn't he? Uh, and was surprised at their response to him saying he wants to find Thomas because all he wants to do is apologise to him for what he did with his trolley and his belongings. And that seemed to have a really good positive effect on Mr. and Mrs. McEwen. So he's set off on this mission now to try and find Thomas. On his travels, he came across another homeless man who grabbed his leg, didn't he? Uh, and sort of said, you know, do you realise what you've taken away from Thomas? And gave Hector a bit of a warning. I think Hector was quite scared. Uh, he went on down, he went to, down an alleyway, didn't he? He came out by the station and found, saw another person, which turned out to be a lady with about 12 or 13 cats. And she was having none of it, was she? She said, I, you know, I'm used to being treated badly by you children. Why should I think you're any different? So he is panicking now. He's still looking, but he's still, I mean, he's grounded, isn't he? So he's gone on that errand of going to help Mrs. Sanders out, but trying to fit all this in at the same time. So let's find out if he finds Thomas. So this is chapter nine, Into the Woods. Right in the middle of London and no one saw anything, said Katie. She had said the same thing about 40 times that day and she wasn't the only one who was talking about it. Uh, who was talking about it. All anyone at school could talk about were the three strange robberies and the invisible thief and the bright yellow symbols that had been left at the crime scenes. Mr Lancaster had even made a really bad joke about it in assembly, warning us not to steal each other's exam papers because they were the most valuable things any of us had. Not one single person laughed, not even Mrs Dawson, who laughs at everything, even fire alarms. We were right there. It would have been so cool if we'd seen something, said Will, kicking a stone and hitting a girl on the shin. Uh, hitting a girl on the shin with it. I could tell it was by accident, but when the girl looked at us, Will gave her a menacing look, as if he had done it on purpose. Apparently, he knows how to get all the police cameras to stop working. Imagine seeing how he does that, said Katie in a dreamy voice. As Katie and Will started talking about all the things they would do, if they had the power to switch off the world's CCTV cameras. I looked around the playground for May Lee. I bet that she could help me find the old man. I just had to make sure no one saw me talking to her. There would be nothing worse than being seen talking to a teacher's pet. I finally saw her in the corner of the playground where the teacher's pets were playing one of their lunchtime games. This one involved trying to kick a tennis ball and running around seven bases, except none of them could kick or catch, so they spent forever at each base or standing around just giggling. May Lee was standing next to the starting base, whispering to Robert and Rania. Just as I spotted her, she looked over at me. I wanted to look away, but for some reason I couldn't, so I scowled at her. That's like his default, isn't it, to make, make out he's really tough and not bothered about anything. Then, without any warning, she started walking towards me. So did Robert and Rania, although they looked far more frightened than she did. I had given Robert a super wedgie, so I knew what he looked like when he was scared. They came to a stop in front of me. Will and Katie stared down at May Lee, as if she was a bug that had appeared out of thin air. What do you want? I asked. My cheeks felt as though someone had placed two freshly microwaved plates right on the top of them. I need to talk to you, said May Lee. 
What do you need to talk to us about? Asked Katie. Maylie shook her head. No, not you, she said to Katie. Or you, she added, looking at Will. Just you, she said, pointing at me. Will snorted as if he couldn't believe what he was hearing. Robert whispered danger through the side of his lips and took a scared step backwards. Over Maylie's shoulders, I could see other kids in the playground starting to look our way. I had to end this and end it quickly. Fine, I said. You've got 20 seconds. I gave Will and Katie a nod to let them know to leave us alone. You heard him, said Will, pushing Robert further back as Katie did the same to Rania. Once they were far, far enough away not to hear me, I whispered, What do you want? I heard you went all over town looking for Thomas yesterday, said May Lee. What? How do you know that? I asked. May Lee didn't answer me. Instead, she asked, So you really want to say sorry to him then? I nodded, making a sad, serious face like I had done for the McEwans. Oh, so he's putting on a face, Hazel. May Lee looked at me so hard that she pretty much used up all her 20 seconds. Finally, she seemed to come to a decision. OK, meet me by the park bench after school. I'll help you find him. Really? I asked. I couldn't believe May Lee had actually believed me and my sad, serious face. Yeah, she said, so long as you do everything I say. After all, you wouldn't want me and my dad telling your dad what you've done, would you? What's that supposed to mean? I asked, feeling confused. What does your dad have to do with anything? You'll find out if you don't apologise and make it up to Thomas properly, said May Lee, grinning. Catch her after school then, and be alone. I opened my mouth, but nothing except a puff of hot air came out. My brain had gone completely blank. Turning on her heels and giving a flip of her ponytail, May Lee walked back to Rania and Robert, who both looked like they had been turned half to stone by their own personal medusas. Everyone else in the playground began to go back to their games, but they were still watching me out of the corners of their eyes. What was all that about? asked Katie with a frown so deep it looked as though it might never leave her forehead. Uh, nothing, I said, telling my brain to think fast and come up with something to say. Katie and Will looked at me in confusion before Katie gave a loud gasp. Hold on, she's not trying to be your girlfriend is she Ooh, cried katie no i said that's ridiculous yeah yes yeah, she is said will jumping up and down and pointing at me i shook my head and punched will on his arm as hard as i could shut up hey said will rubbing his arm all right calm down said katie surprised at how angry i was will and katie didn't ask me anything else after that but for the rest of the day, I could tell they were watching me and May Lee closely, like two really rubbish spies. At home, I told Will and Katie I had to get home. I'm oh, sorry, at home time, I told Will and Katie I had to get home quickly and left them. Sprinting to the old man's bench, I saw May Lee was already there and she was sat reading a book. Finally, she said when she saw me, What? I'm not even late. All right, no need to get all crocodile and snap at me, she replied, standing up. I stuffed my hands in my pockets. I wanted to frighten her in some way and show her that she couldn't talk to me like I was silly, but she knew too much. How did you know I was looking for the old, I mean, uh, for Thomas? I asked. It had been bothering me all afternoon. May Lee tilted her head to one side and looked at me just like Mrs. Vergara did as if she was trying to multiply a really long number in her head. Me and my dad volunteer in the soup kitchen off the high street. It's where all the local homeless people go. Dad's friends with everyone, and everyone tells him everything. So homeless people did have a secret network, only they were called soup kitchens. I wondered if the police knew about that already. But how does your dad know my dad? My dad doesn't work in the soup kitchen. Well, not that I knew of anyway. 
Because of his new film, said May Lee. He's spoken to us on the phone. And he's going to come and film us very soon. I made a pfft noise, which came out louder than I thought it would. And before I could stop myself, I said, Why do you want to film you? You're just a boring teacher's pet. Oh, there's a bit of name calling going on in this chapter, Hazel. My words made May Lee's cheeks flood with colour, like two cups being filled with a bright pink lemonade. Because he likes me, and he told me that I was important and should be in his film, she snapped back. I scowled at her. She had spoken to my dad, and he had actually liked her and asked her to be in his film. He had never asked me anything like that, not ever. I guess I wasn't important enough for him. Whatever, I said. Just show me where Thomas is. Fine, she said. Let's go. But instead of turning to leave the park like I had thought she would, she began to make her way down towards the lake. Where are you going? I asked, trailing after her. I wondered if this was a trick and May Lee and her dad and their secret homeless society were planning to push me into the lake for, for revenge. To Thomas, she replied, followed by something that sounded like, duh. But he doesn't live in the park anymore. I checked yesterday. Thomas doesn't just stay in one part of the park, you know, explained May Lee. He likes to sleep in the bit under those trees too, except when it gets too cold and starts raining, then he sleeps on the night buses. Oh, that's the first reference to the night bus, isn't it? How do you know all that, I asked. Because he's my friend. I've known him for almost a year now, ever since Dad started working at the soup kitchen. Walking right around the lake, we reached the tallest group of oak trees in the park, all standing to an attention like an army dressed in a uniform of green leaves. May Lee headed straight into them, and, as the trees got so big and tall that even the sunlight had to fight to make its way through, I saw it. A small green tent, and, beside it, a tall figure sitting on top of a red sleeping bag wearing a crumpled black coat, tatty white trainers and a woolly yellow hat. Hi Thomas, said May Lee, waving as she jumped over a log to join him. The old man stood up with a smile. Well, hello my little lady, what brings you here? May Lee waited for me, for me to reach them before answering. Thomas, this is Hector from my class at school. He wanted to meet you. And Hector, this is Thomas, the man who you need to apologise to. Oh, OK. So he's meeting Thomas. Um, like I said just now, there was a little bit of name calling going on in that chapter. But I I included it in because I, I think it is it's integral to this story, Hazel, to show you what all the underlying tones are here of what's going on between the children, why Hector, I feel, feels that he has to act like this kind of tough guy. I'm still not convinced that he is. Um, May Lee seems to be taking charge a little bit more now, doesn't she? And, and Hector's a little bit wary of her now. Uh, he's hurt too, I think, of the connection between May Lee and her dad. And his dad, he had no idea that they'd spoken and that he'd asked May Lee. Um, a touching little bit, which I think gives us an in, an, another insight into how he feels sort of invisible in his own home, I think. That, well, my dad's never asked me anything like that. Maybe I'm not important enough. So I think we are definitely getting a feel for the level of Hector's self-esteem which I know you know what that means but basically what he feels about himself and my feeling is is that he doesn't feel good about himself at all so that was the end of chapter nine so I will leave it with you there have a lovely evening and I will check in with you again tomorrow I'm going to record chapter 10 now straight after this one well I'm going to make a cup of tea first and then I'm going to record it. So I will see you again tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye.